you know, when you read the story of Genesis, sometimes I like to wonder what would have happened when God said to Adam, what have you done? And Adam had said to God, I sinned and I'm sorry, rather than pointing the finger, but just owned it. You know, our history could have been so much different. Hello there, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to another video here on Armor of God. Again, I would like to thank all of you for your support and contribution in any discussion we're having in the comment area. In this video, I would like to share with you the compilation of highlights that real exorcists have said in their respective lectures and interviews that I hope will be useful in your own spiritual warfare. As always, I've provided the links to each link of the audio clip shared in this video, so feel free to check them out in the description box below. Before I share any of the highlight, here is my usual introduction. There are many people who reject the notion of angelic creatures and believe that the existence of angels and demons, along with the likes of exorcism and demon possession, come out of a primitive superstition. For some people to even talk about exorcism and demons is an embarrassment, and for these people, evil is something of our own making who believe that evil is nothing more than humanity's inhumane treatment of one another, but certainly not something that is personified. But here's the truth. The rejection of the existence of angels and demons does not make them any less real or imaginary. In fact, the negation of the angelic world is not a trait of our modern world. For us Catholics in particular, in the Catholic tradition, it is biblical revelation and the magisterium of the church that consistently confirms the truth of the existence of angels and demons. The Catechism of the Catholic Church states that God, our creator of all visible and invisible things, the corporeal and the spiritual, by means of his own omnipotent power at once, from the beginning of time, created each creature angelic and mundane. When it comes to the existence of demons, it was Pope Paul back in 1972 who stated clearly that evil is not merely the lack of something, but an effective agent, a living spiritual being. He went on to say that it is contrary to the teaching of the Bible and the church to refuse to recognize the existence of such a reality or to try to explain it away as a pseudo-reality, a conceptual and fanciful personification of the unknown causes of our misfortunes. So now let's get on with the highlight then. I'm sorry my introduction was a little bit long. Sometimes I've had children ask me, Father, is it possible that the devil could one day repent? And the answer is no, they cannot. They are incapable of repenting and their damnation is eternal. For demons, no redemption is possible. So why is this the case? It's because God no longer offers them the grace that could per se convert them. For them, the hour of choice has passed. Being very intellectual creatures, they knew every possible consequence of what would happen to them if they rejected God. And even when they could see that one of the consequences would be eternal damnation, they still chose to rebel against God. We as humans have the, capac the capacity to continue to grow and learn, to constantly be converted. And so for humans, we can change. That's a part of our nature, but not for a purely intellectual creature who can see again because of their intellect every possible consequence of a choice that they might make. And you can also hear Father Carlos Martins addressing the same question with his answer just about the same like Father Lampert's. Angels cannot, they are incapable of repenting of their choice because the sheer power of their cognition. Yeah. They don't choose from a place of ignorance. They're choosing from a place of an awareness that we just cannot imagine. And so their, their choice, whether to follow God, whether to rebel against God, is forever. And that choice by the demons puts them in a prison, as I mentioned. It's a prison where they desire out of that prison to bring as many within it yeah. in order to somehow prove that God was wrong in creating this creature.
The reason I'm sharing the clip of Father Martin answering the same question is to show the consistency in terms of what these priests believe, what the church believes, and they don't act independently. And that is exactly what Father Gary Thomas addresses in the next clip. Then we have an authoritative ritual. So that, to me, is really what most distinguishes Roman Catholicism and our approach to the demonic from every other, whether he, he or she be a freelance exorcist or someone who's directly connected to another ecclesial body. We have an authoritative ritual. The Orthodox also have an authoritative ritual. And what distinguishes Roman Catholicism from the Orthodox insofar as the practice of exorcism is that in their tradition, every priest is deputized to be an exorcist. In our tradition, the bishop is the chief exorcist of the diocese by right of his ordination, and he can deputize someone like me to so do that. Or he can deputize someone else on the spot and say, this is a, an ad hoc case, I need you to go and deal with it. But I would say that would be the, the thing, the, 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 that would be the point of, of, of demarcation that would be the easiest one to differentiate, would be the fact we have an authoritative ritual that goes back to 1614. Over the past few weeks, the comments have been coming in fast, and I saw quite a number of comments saying that the demons seem to be targeting Christians. And these type of comments will go on saying that this is all nonsense, or that they can't believe people still believe there's an all-powerful being called God, or that this is the 21st century, not the Middle Ages anymore. Well, in that case, in the next clip, Father Lampert has something to say about it. When someone called in and said, well, I'm an atheist, I don't believe in the devil, I don't believe in demons, and I watch scary movies, and they don't have an impact on me. So why is that? And my response was, well, if the devil already has won you over, there's no need to fight you. Yeah. If he already has you, he'll move on to his next victim. Because if one already says they don't believe in God, if the devil were to afflict them, it may actually lead that person into a relationship with God, a thing that the devil certainly would not want to do. Listening to these exorcists, I found a couple instances where they do respect the devil, and before you arrive at the wrong conclusion, please listen carefully to what Father Dan Real and Father Carlos Martins are really saying. Um, he's to be respected in the fact that he's more powerful than I am. And it's only by God's power that I do what I do. I don't, it's nothing is from me. I am just the conduit that he works through. And I tend to be probably in a bad way fearless, which is helpful with this ministry. I don't get afraid because I really, really, if you want me to do it, I'm going to do it, but you have to protect me. And the same is with regard to the devil. Next to God, the devil is a very, very minor reality, but he is dangerous. He is dangerous. And for that reason, I respect him. But I do not. And this next clip will be rather interesting regarding what Father Chad Ripperger said about a demon called Isis. And so if you notice that you're struggling in a specific area, and in this case extreme anger, according to Father Ripperger, extreme anger is the domain of the demon Isis, who is a cruel and vicious demon that we ever have to deal with. And Father Ripperger also adds that the demon Isis is even worse than Satan in a certain sense. Extreme anger is the domain of the demon Isis. And the reason it's his domain is because Isis, his fall was precipitated by the fact that he refused to accept Christ's mercy for men. And as a result of that, he became the most cruel, vicious demon you ever have to deal with. He's even worse than Satan in a certain sense. Satan has his own set of characteristics that you have to deal with. But this guy is just cruel and vicious. But that tells you that he drives these particular things. And, and as you begin to have a vice, you start building this compatibility with the demon, and he just you become easily manipulatable. In the next clip, Father Carlos Martin shares the three questions he asked the demons during exorcisms. And Father Martin also adds that the demons do not want to answer these three questions. Here's why. So the three questions I will ask a demon when a demon finally manifests, when, when I'm certain of possession, is what is your name? For what were you created? Why did God create you? Who is your nemesis in heaven? Who, who is in heaven? 
whom you particularly hate. Now, the demons never want to answer those questions. So it, it will take work. It will take prayer. Uh, it'll take combating to get that information out. But when I have those pieces of information, I have a lot, right? So I can address him by his name. If I know for what purpose he was created, that gives me knowledge as to the, his makeup. Uh, so he rejected that j that job by the Lord. He, he is mm. constantly rejecting his duty. So I'm going to look for a saint who fulfills that duty. And who who's your nemesis in heaven? Well, he's telling me which saint he particularly despises and hates. And so I will immediately uh, obtain a relic of, of that saint. I'll go fetch it from my office if... I don't have it, then I will immediately try to obtain it uh, because they are visceral against them. They produce a visceral, painful reaction. Now as for the next highlight, there are probably a lot of you who may be familiar with the Annabelle doll from the movie Conjuring. In fact, in the beginning of the movie, Ed Warren played by Patrick Wilson and Lorraine Warren, who was played by Vera Farmiga, did provide a short explanation to what really happened to the doll. However, let's hear what Father Lampert, who is a real-life exorcist, has to say about it instead. There are items that can be used in a negative sense. So when we talk about demonic infestation, it's not just in a location, but it can be associated with an object. So there are objects that can be used to uh, advance what the devil is trying to do. So you think of voodoo or witchcraft. Think of people that use magic wands. Think of Ouija boards, voodoo dolls. You know, there's a lot of things that are uh, that can be used in a negative sense. So those things are very much real. Now, if an item has the presence of evil with it, the question I would ask is, is the object inherently evil? Meaning, obviously, if it's a voodoo doll, it's inherently evil. But it is possible for a regular object, perhaps, to have a curse placed upon it. It may not be inherently evil, but because of the curse placed upon it, it's bringing about the presence of the demonic. And in that case, that object simply could be blessed to return it to its original state, if you will. But something that's inherently evil should always be destroyed. And again, think of things, the Ouija board, a magic wand, tarot cards, again, things like that. And because we're covering what Father Lampert is sharing at this point in the video, Father Lampert also explains the difference between the old rite and new rite of exorcism regarding exorcists asking the names of demons. You have probably seen this in movies where the priests will be screaming at the demons asking for their names. Something goes along like this. In the name of Jesus Christ, tell me your name. But why don't we hear about this in more details from Father Lampert himself, and why do they need to know the names of the demons in the first place during exorcisms? That's one of the differences in the old rite and the new rite. In the older rite of the church, the demon is commanded to give its name. That's not included in the new rite. But in the old rite, the belief was that if you know the demon's name, then it's showing weakness because if you know someone's name you have a certain power or control over them so when the demon names itself it's showing that it's submitting to the power and the authority of god some of the names can be pretty generic such as think of the seven deadly sins gluttony lust whatever it might be some of the names are uh, very formal the demon leviathan mentioned in the Bible is one that I've encountered in this ministry, you know, Beelzebul. Again, so there are, I try not to get too fixated on researching the name because I'm not really that interested in the identity of the demon. I'm more interested again in, in what God is doing in the life of the person who's afflicted through the rite of exorcism of the church because exorcists are trained not to get too fascinated with uh, the demonic world. And it could be that the demon is, you know, readily gives its name as a way to create a fascination with it. So, you know, it names itself and kind of move on. I will say in one of the exorcisms 
that I perform, the person that was possessed by seven demons, when I commanded the demons to name themselves, all seven names came out of the mouth of the person at the same time. So again, when you're dealing with the demonic world, it can be a, a pretty crazy place to be. And finally, I'm going to share the last highlight of this compilation with Father Carlos Martins explaining the real job of an exorcist, and it is not to cast out demons. Let's hear from Father Martins himself then. The job of the exorcist is not, contrary to popular opinion and contrary to what is common, commonly, uh, what is intuitively thought by people, it's not to cast out the devil. Right. The job of the exorcist is to find out why is the devil there? Yeah. He, what rights has he obtained to be present where he is? And it's the job of the exorcist then to aid the victim who is ensnared to rescind those rights. Well, that is all for this time, everybody. Thanks so much for watching this video, and I really do hope that I've shared something that will help you a lot in your own spiritual warfare. Just remember what Father Vincent Lampert keep on saying during his lectures and interviews, we don't have to do anything extraordinary to repel the evil one from our lives. It's the very ordinary things that we do that will keep the devil at bay. Go to church. Pray. Those are the key and essential ingredients. Again, my sincerest thanks to all of you and my apology for the video taking too much of your time. God bless you and until next time.